was, um, I think, Andy and I have, Andy and my first collaboration, and it still uh, forms the basis of, of my understanding of sinus disease. It's really about the differential of, of sinusitis. But, uh, but it's important because I know pacantrum is a common incidental finding on, it used to be on plain forms, but even on, on CT. And there's this misconception that sinus pacification equals sinusitis. But there is a wide differential, which is uh, probably wider than the, than the uh, Petrus apex. But when you look at it, it looks daunting at first, but it's not, it's not too bad, because really you've got a congenital entity and then acquired entities, of which this whole lot are really the inflammatory group, small group of dental entities, bony lesions, trauma for completeness sake, and, and tumors. So when you look at it that way, it's not... It's not that daunting, even more so than the Petrus apex. On this slide, I, I use ad nauseum. But, but you can see, particularly in the sinus, that, that virtually identical appearance can, can occur with completely different entities. Um, and as with the Petrus apex, I'm, I'm going to really address in the same way, highlighting the subtleties that help differentiate, differentiate the lesions. As opposed to the Petrus apex, the, the mainstay in imaging in, in the opaque antrum is CT. You can get a clue from the clinical history and the setting. MR is fantastic for specificity in, in certain instances and is absolutely essential in tumor evaluation. But when it comes to sinus disease, the starting point is, is the CT study. And as I said, the entities can either be congenital or a much larger group acquired. As far as congenital groups, sinus hyperplasia could be unilateral or bilateral. The precise cause of which is uncertain and various theories include failure of intrauterine development or infection in the first year of life, um, the appearance is usually the same and as the name suggests it is a small antrum. It's the only one of the opacified entities that presents with a small antrum. So you have a small antrum associated with ipsilateral enlarged orbit, ipsilateral enlarged uh, middle meatus, and importantly, and very importantly, the unsinted process is, is hypoplastic, lateralized to abut the inframedial orbital wall. And that's, that's crucial. The first, the first point is because it's abutting the inframedial orbital wall, it nips off the ostium and infundibulum. And so the sinus typically is a pacified. So most hypoplastic sinus we see are pacified. Not all, but most. But more importantly, from a, a therapeutic point of view, if uh, endoscopic surgery is to be planned, normally the endoscopic surgery, the first... Uh, entity that is dissected is, is the unsinted process. And if we don't appreciate that it's plastered up against the inframedial orbital wall, when the surgeon goes in, they could uh, um, inadvertently damage the inferior orbit. So that is the opacified hypoplastic antrum. And that really is the differentiating feature. It's a small opaque antrum, secondary signs and of large orbit and nasal cavity, and there's a lateralized, um, there's a lateralized a process, which, as I said, is really important to recognize in the setting of uh, planned surgery. The other important thing, which, which I'll come back to, is that the maxillary alveolus is thickened there, and that's an important differentiator um, between the silent sinus syndrome, which I will come to. Sinusitis, I'm not going to labor b um, because the, the imaging is, is easy and, and we pressed for time, but the bottom line is acute sinusitis is a clinical entity and doesn't require tr um, imaging. Um, imaging is usually reserved for if the diagnosis is in doubt or if we expect complications. But when it is imaged, the hallmark is the air fluid level. You get subtotal or total sinus pacification with air fluid levels. And remember the air fluid level is not pathognomonic for sinusitis. You can see it in kids that are crying. You can see it in, in uh, polyposis. But in their correct setting, it, it, it alludes to the diagnosis. And, and really it's an opacified sinus with an air fluid level. Chronic sinusitis also sinus pacification. The difference with chronic sinusitis is that repeated bouts of inflammation result in mucosal changes, most notably hypertrophy. The hypertrophied sinus blocks the drainage ostium, and you get the self-perpetuating um, process. But the hallmark is really mucosal thickening, as opposed to fluid, and bony changes, of which the most important is uh, sclerosis. But you, you, it, it's not always sclerotic, but certainly sclerosis is a good indicator of chronicity of the process. And as I said, the, the hypertrophied mucosa blocks the drainage pathway, and that can often be exacerbated, as you saw in that case, by a small hello cell or, or congenital variant. Normally with sinusitis, you don't get maxillary sinus involvement um, 
by itself, you usually get the whole osteomyosal complex involved, and so you get frontal, anterior ethmoid, and maxillary. So sinusitis per se is not a difficult one. There's a good history of sinus, sinusitis, either an acute event or recurrent acute events. Um, and as I said, acute, acute sinusitis is characterized by airflow levels, chronic by mucosal thickening and bony changes, and the bony changes are important. And then usually the antrum is involved with other sinuses. Fungal sinusitis is an interesting and completely different entity, but an interesting variant on, on inflammatory disease, and it exists in both invasive and non-invasive forms, and I'm not going to discuss the, the invasive in this talk. Um, the non-invasive forms include allergic fungal sinusitis, which involves multiple sinuses, similar imaging characteristics in that you know, multiple sinuses involved with high-density material and mildly expansile uh, nature in those, usually unilateral. But the one I do want to talk about is, is the fungal ball or mycetoma. These occur in immunocompetent and non-atopic individuals. It's extremely common in Western Australia, actually. They're usually asymptomatic, or there may be sensation of a little bit of pressure over the sinus. It may be minor pain, but they're relatively asymptomatic. Um, and typically it affects a single sinus, of which the maxillary sinus or antrum is the most common. The imaging features are pathognomonic. You have a low-density mass, which is mildly expansive, filling the sinus, in the center of which is high-density and or calcification. That high-density being calcium phosphate or sulfate absorbed onto the heavy, uh, or heavy metals absorbed onto the fungal hyphae, and calcification, and typically they have sclerotic walls. So if you look at the posterior lateral wall of the antrum there as opposed to the other side, you see the dense sclerosis indicating the chronicity of the process. Remember the MR appearance. MR appearance of fungal disease can be extremely uh, confusing. I think it's over-talked, but it's certainly, it's certainly relevant. And, and on MR, the fungus is T1 hypo and T2 hypo intense. And it's predominantly that T2, T2 hypo intensity that gets confusing. If you look at this case, this is the same case. Patient has a completely opacified antrum. If you look carefully, there probably is a little bit of hyperdensity, even on the bony setting, supramedially with the antrum. If you look at the MR, it's pitch black. And the point about it being pitch black, the mark T2 hypo intensity, is that it can be misinterpreted by the uninitiated as air. So a black sinus on MR is not always an aerated sinus. As I say, I think these days we tend to be aware of that and it probably is over-talked and it's never quite as black as that, but it can be. So the hallmarks of fungal sinusitis, usually have a, sorry, you, almost ha you have an entity filling the sinus, but that low-density entity contains high-density material and or calcification. It has a thick wall usually. Um, and be aware of the low signal intensity on T2. As with all the inflammatory conditions, and I'll come back to this, is this does not enhance. Um, the silent sinus syndrome is an interesting syndrome, and as I said, chronic sinus disease may be associated with bony changes, of which most commonly you get um, sclerosis, but the walls can sometimes be sucked in. So what happens is you get a, a sinus disease, completely a pacified antrum, the uncinted process, as in hypoplasia, gets sucked laterally to about the inframedial orbital margin, the ostium and infundibulum is occluded, and the sinus is pacified. But what you then get is you get the margins being sucked in. You can see the walls are relatively thick, but the margins get retracted in, and that results in increasing craniocaudal distance of the orbit and an ophthalmos. And so these patients present with facial asymmetry and or diplopia, and the sinus disease, as the name suggests, is relatively silent. The differentiating feature here, and to go back to hyperplasia, if you look at the alveolus, the alveolus is normal. It's normally developed. The sinus is normally developed, and this is something that is developed as a result of sinus disease rather than hypoplasia, which looks very similar, but the alveolus is underdeveloped and thick because the sinus has never expanded down there. So another case, you can see subtle um, opacified Sinus, the uncinted process lateralizes as opposed to normal uncinted process on the other side. Um, even on the, on the first picture, you can see the increased craniocaudal uh, distance on the, on the right relative to the left, and there's an ophthalmus if you look at it critically. So, the silent sinus syndrome is a normally developed but a pacified sinus. It's associated with infundibular occlusion, and you have the enlarged middle meatus and lateral retraction uncinted, as you don't do in hypoplasia, but the key is the increased craniocaudal distance of the orbit caused by the sinus wall retraction.
this is what Andy was talking to, retention cyst and intracranial polyps. The retention cyst is an extremely common sequel of inflammatory disease of the sinus. And all it is, is obstruction of a single serum mucinous gland. So it's in a blocked gland. Its significance is that it reflects prior inflammatory change. And because it's a blocked gland, it's basically a bag of fluid on imaging. And they, they present as these low density, um, dome-shaped structures, usually within the floor of the antrum. They can move around a bit. But the imaging characteristics of both CT and MR are basically are bags of fluid. And given that there are bags of fluid, they do not enhance, or the matrix of them does not enhance. So retention cyst easy, both on plain form and on CT. And as Andy said, I'm sure you'll be sick of them by the end of the day. But they are dome-shaped, they are low density, they're dependent within the sinus, and they don't enhance. Um, an antrocranial polyp is basically a big retention cyst. So it's one that enlarges to fill the antrum. It then has very little space left to enlarge into, and so it squeezes out, usually through the accessory ostium, into the middle meatus. And you get this formation of this dumbbell-shaped structure, low density, because once again it's a bag of fluid, um, which fills the antrum, fills the middle meatus, and connected via a narrow stalk, usually through the accessory ostium. And then, running out of space in the middle meatus, it tracks backwards into the nasopharynx. So that, that's all it is. It is a big retention cyst. And so its imaging characteristics are that, both on C, CT and MR, it is a big bag of fluid, in this instance dumbbell-shaped, and following a specific pathway of least resistance, which is filling antrum through accessory ostium into the middle meatus and then into the nasopharynx. Importantly here, once again, they don't enhance. And I, I keep on making this point because an inflammatory process, whilst you may get enhancement around the margins of an inflammatory into the matrix doesn't enhance, and it's an important differentiator between benign or inflammatory disease and tumor, which I'll come to. And it's probably never more important than when, when analyzing mucoseals, because mucoseals can be hard. Um, mucoseals, as you know, and as I alluded to in the Petra's apex, arise from obstruction of, of the entire sinus, as opposed to a retention cyst where, where they arise from an obstructed gland. Here, the entire drainage pathway of the sinus is obstructed. And they're extremely common in sinonasal disease, but not in the antrum. In the antrum, almost every single one, and, and it's, it's a minuscule percentage of antral involvement with mucosal, almost every single one occurs in the post-operative antrum. So fortunately, they don't occur in the antrum. But even, even in other aspects of cyanonasal imaging, they're difficult to, uh, to diagnose because um, they continue to excrete themselves. You get an expansile lesion. That expansile lesion then may erode or usually markedly thin the bone. But in this case... Uh, the soft tissue uh, settings, it's impossible to know whether that's a soft tissue tumor um, or mucus seals. You just can't see the, the posterior margin. But if you contrast this easy, the mucus seal will not enhance, tumor will enhance. So the inflammatory entities don't enhance. And just remember that, uh, fortunately, in the antrum, and I won't, I won't label all of this, but the antrum, the mucus seals are very rare. They virtually never occur, if at all, in, in a healthy... Um, or native antrum, only in the post-op antrum. As Andy said, dental disease is important. An evaluation of sinuses is not complete until you've looked at the teeth. And the reason is the roots of the motors and premotors have an intimate relationship with, with uh, the antrum. And so it's not surprising that dental disease can have some sort of influence on, on the antrum itself. And in fact, mucosal thickening is twice as common in patients with dental diseases of general population. Importantly also that obviously dental disease can then influence the antrum um, and cause confusion clinically. And what's really important is that if pe people with pa facial pain, you get antral opacification, but the clinicians get confused that the sinus may actually be causing the pain, whereas in fact it's a tooth all along. So it's really important from our point of view to highlight that it may be that a dental disease that causes symptoms, irrespective of degree of pacification of the antrum. Um, I won't label this. Andy's already extensively discussed periapical and periodontal inflammatory change and, and infection. And you can see, these are an example of each, you can see the extensive dental disease associated with fairly extensive antral pacification. And Andy, I'm sure, will elaborate more later on, on the significance of that, particularly in the dental setting. Um, the other big dental group is this, this, this group that we all try to avoid, and that is the odontogenic cyst and tumor group. Um, 
and there's nothing worse for registrars than to you know contemplate getting this in the exam but it is a heterogeneous group and really they present as well-defined uh, multilocular or unilocular low density of expand cell lesions and the out for all of us all of us is that they are indistinguishable on the basis of radiology alone. You can get a clue based on its relationship to a tooth or possibly a bit of high density within an entity, but really um, they can be very difficult to diagnose and the final arbitrator is, is usually histology. And that really is an out for us as radiologists. But the key differentiator, and the one thing to remember is this little crescent of bone over the top of the lesion. That is the floor of the antrum that has been bowed up by the extra antral lesion and it is the key differentiator between a dental lesion arising outside of the antrum and an expansile lesion arising for example mucus arising within the antrum so even though we can't really diagnose or we may not be able to diagnose what it is we can say that this is a dental lesion rather than than a primarily an antral lesion as i said relationship to uh, tooth may be of may be of relevance and give us a clue and this is a dentigerous cyst which often relates uh, um, to an unerupted canine or third molar and here you can see there is an unerupted tooth and you can see the barely perceptible crescent of bone over the top of it but which does suggest that this is an extra antral lesion and fairly typical appearance of a dentigerous cyst um, you can see here the uh, the covering is sometimes really difficult to appreciate the name of this lesion has changed, sorry, and it's now called KTOC or keratinizin cystic odontogenic tumor. I think I've got that right. I can never get it, but um, and I apologize for not changing it. But the essence of this lesion, it looks like fungal disease outside the sinus. And basically, these tumors secrete keratin into themselves, and they present just as all the others. But you can get a clue as to what they may be by an unenhanced CT, the high-density material within it. And then, you, then the next step is, could this be fungus disease? But we know there's a little crescent over the top of it, which would indicate that it's an extra antral lesion as opposed to a primarily antral lesion. And um, on T2, it has fairly typical features with low-density dropout. The important thing about all of this is, is, as I've said all along, is that although you can have a clue as to what they are, they're often indistinguishable on the basis of the radiology alone. But our job is to identify that um, it's an extra antral lesion as opposed to an antral lesion based on that little thin crescent of bone. And then we can have a guess as to what, what it may or may not be. The other heterogeneous group that can affect the sinuses and given a pacified sinus, obviously something that affects the surrounding bones, and that is this, this non-specific group of fibrous osseous lesions. Uh, of the facial bones where basically normal bone is, is replaced by fibrous tissue with varying amounts of mineralization um, and the big one that we always see is fibrous dysplasia which usually in the facial region affects a single single sinus sing, a single bone and uh, presents a facial asymmetry, asymmetry sorry but in the maxillofacial region often you get this flowing of one bone to another and for some reason um, it does not tend to cross the midline so we see fibrous displays in its curious form, which often may be confused. It used to be the old, the old days, you see a plain form with a pacified antrum. Now on CT, it's, it's pretty easy to recognize fibrous dysplasia. Um, the second group that may affect uh, the antrum is, is this, this other group of uh, lesions arising from the periodontal, periodontal ligamentous space, of which I'm really showing this as a curiosity because it's a rare entity and the only one that may really affect the antrum is this one, the central cement ossifying fibroma. And I show it because Andy actually diagnosed, this was a real case that Andy picked up. And it showed a varying, uh, it's a tumor showed of various portions of fibrous disease, cement and bone. And I won't, I won't label the point. The point I do want to show is that it has calcification in it, but importantly, there's that little crescent of bone, which is the floor of the antrum bowed up, confirming that this arises outside of the antrum as opposed to within it. Trauma, I've included for completeness sake, and I won't label it. Mid-face zygomatic complex fractures, and particularly blowout fractures, are well known to pacify the antrum. And I won't label blowout. Occasionally, maybe iatrogenic, and particularly uh, dental work, and both this and the next case were given to me by Andy. That is a bit of a root fragment that has been displaced into antrum, generates an intense irritant-type 
mucosal um, response. You can see a markedly opacified antrum. Um, and this is actually root material, root filling material that actually got stuck in the, in the ostium and infundibulum. Um, neoplasms are important. I just want to end off on a brief discussion. Now, obviously, detailed discussions beyond the scope of this talk, but general principles are really important about uh, cyanonasal neoplasm. The first is that there's considerable overlap in the clinical presentation. Considerable overlap in the presentation of, of tumors which are usually late presenters with inflammatory disease. So often, the first time we discover a tumor is in the CT performed to exclude sinus disease or in the preoperative workup for sinus disease. So it's important to be aware of it. Tumors, as tumors do, present as soft tissue masses. Everything I've showed up to now has been fairly low density because it's, it's been inflammatory. There's been a lot of water in it. Tumors are soft tissue masses, and so they present as such on imaging. They are solid. They're soft tissue masses. And critically, they enhance. And the matrix of tumors enhance. And that is the big differentiator between, between neoplastic disease and all of the other entities we've spoken about so far. There is avid enhancement on both CT and MR, um, bony changes are important, and most tumors, and particularly the malignant tumors, are associated with aggressive bony destruction. Um, a more expansile um, type of bony change tends to go with benign disease, but it's really important to remember that you do get some slow-growing tumors which have an identical appearance. So lymphoma, melanoma particularly, may get, give you an expansile type pattern. So the bony change that may look um, benign may not be. So we can't rely on that alone. Um, and then I've touched on MR all the way through. It is absolutely critical to evaluate cyanonasal tumors with, with MR. And the reason is it defines the tumor better from surrounding structures, retained secretions, but also shows all the important prognostic features to better effect, and that is um, involvement of the dura, intracranial extension, perineural tumor spread, orbital involvement. Um, and so if we think we have a tumor, a patient must have an MRI. So that is your solid soft tissue tumor, and you can see extensive bony change. Um, just to highlight one or two, the most common benign tumor is probably the inverting papilloma, and remember it does have malignant potentials, um, but that presents as a lobulated so, um, soft tissue mass in the middle meatus. Because it's in the middle meatus, it's going to obstruct the antrum, and more commonly obstructs other sinuses uh, in the osteomeatal complex, and that would be the, the anterior ethmoid and um, frontal as well. The key to the inverting papilloma is enhancement characteristics. And both on CT and MRI, it has this convoluted cerebriform type of enhancement. And that is pathognomonic. I mean, that's the one we're probably showing the exams to the, to the students because it's such a pathognomonic type of, of enhancement. Um, the real strength of MRI, as we said, and you can see on T1 post-GAD here, you can see the tumor enhancing in its cerebriform nature. nature as opposed to the non-enhancing trap fluid within the antrum. On T2, you always see the tumor as a gray or black entity with surrounding fluid. So it's a really nice differentiator of normal from abnormal trap fluid from abnormal tissues. And then, vitally, um, in malignant tumors, you then go on to use MR for staging, for a regional involvement, for perineural tumor spread. The malignant tumors tend to have the same, same uh, pattern throughout. Um, and that is a destructive solid soft tissue mass because the vast majority, more than 80%, are squamous cell carcinomas. And the problem, as I said, is they present late. Um, they present as solid soft tissue masses um, with regional bony destruction and spread. And even on CT here, as I've alluded to, you can see the regional infraorbital nerve is a little bit fuzzy, the orbital floor is gone, and so you have to just press on and do... MR for these, and as I said, and this, this case just shows a little bit of perineural tumor spread, so you've got a big, enhancing, ugly looking tumor, it's regional spread, but also V2 involvement. So, so I think when it comes to tumors, you should look critically and actively um, for perineural spread, for involvement of the orbit, for involvement of the brain, for involvement of, of the dura. And if we suspect it on CT, even if we're wrong, it's probably a good idea to do MR. So that's the full spectrum and just to summarize sinus disease, because I know it's a lot in a short space of time, bottom line is CT is still the modality of choice. MR is used as a second-line investigation and is absolutely essential in tumors. Um, 
But when we look at an antrum and a pacified antrum, we start off with various things. You look at the size. Is it a small antrum? In other words, is it a hypoplastic antrum? Or is it a normal size, um, normally developed antrum? If it is hypoplastic, remember the lateralized uncinar process. Look critically at the density of the contents. Are they high density um, contents, such as you see in fungal disease? Or is it low density retention cyst, entrocone, or polyp mucosal? Um, are other sinuses involved? Is there a history of sinusitis? You know, is this just sinusitis? Look at the bony changes. Is it expansile bony change? Is it destructive bony change? Could it be tumor? Look at the enhancement characteristics. Are, are, you know, is this a tumor all along? Is the matrix and central bit enhancing? And that can be hard because sometimes the margins are blurred, but always look at the center of a lesion. Is this a tumor? Is it an extra antral lesion? In other words, although it's expansile, is there a thin plate over the top suggesting it arose from uh, the extra antral maxillary alveolus? And what's the relation to the tooth? Could this be dental disease?